number 73. I want us to focus on a word today and think about one word in this uh, whole chapter of Psalm. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that to you in just a moment, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this privilege to call upon thee today. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. And Lord, we live in a world, Father, that seems like it's full of uncertainty. It seems like, uh, Father, there's many things going on that would discourage a Christian. Lord, that would discourage a believer. And Father, it seems like there's so many things that the devil has to distract, Lord, a lost person from coming to know you. But I pray right now, God, in the next little while, God, I pray the sweet Spirit of God would speak to our hearts and help us to focus upon thee and not the cares of the world or the things of the world. Because, Lord, they look dim. But, God, I'm glad to know that I'm yours and you're mine. Father, I'm glad to know this morning that when I leave this world, I'll be in a better place. I'll go to heaven, Lord, when I leave this world. And God, what a great blessing it is to know that. Lord, should there be someone here today that's not certain of where they'll spend eternity, may today be the day they come to know you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to rightly divide the word of truth and say nothing contrary to thy will, but all we'd say would be to thy glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Psalm chapter number 73, I'll begin reading with verse number 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. Now, I'm, I'm going to kind of preach my way through this, so we'll, uh, we'll stop and go. But I'll say to you today, God is good to Israel. He always will be good to Israel. Israel is the, is the uh, place on the map which all the world wants to destroy Israel is the place on the map where all nations are turning against the nation of Israel, even the United States. We're turning our backs, and look out, friend, when we, when we make statements or, or our leadership makes statements as they have the last few weeks and try to, uh, you know, try, try to, to show their, really show their despise for the nation of Israel, our country is headed for more tragedy than we've ever known in our lifetime. And so you look out, friend, don't, you know, you expect disaster to come to this country and come soon, I believe, because of our stand with the, against the nation of Israel. Sure, they're our ally, and most American people love Israel, but the leadership is what determines uh, the, the shape of a nation and the direction of a nation. And so God's good to Israel. God's good to Israel. God loves Israel. God will take care of Israel. God will preserve Israel. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Now, the, the psalmist Asaph, he's the psalmist here, he says these words, <clears throat> But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. What's he talking about? He's saying, my, my feet almost slipped. I'm almost gone. I have... And he, he explains why uh, down in the remainder of the chapter. He says, I have almost given up. I have almost backslid. I've almost went to the place that I, that I used to be. And here's what he says. My steps had, had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. See, he began to get his eyes off of God and begin to get his eyes on the world and the things of the world. And he began to see how that the wicked seemed to prosper and those that lived godly and tried to serve the Lord and do what God wanted them to do seemed like they suffered and had, had much poverty in their lives. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Who's he talking about? The prosperity of the, of the wicked. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have uh, more than the heart could wish. Get your eyes off God. Look at the things of the world. Look at what everybody else has got. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. If we do that, then we too will get discouraged and be disparaged because we don't understand why the wicked prosper. Well, let me tell you something about the wicked, friend. The wicked may prosper, not all of them, but some of them prosper. Millions and billions of dollars they acquire, millions of, of houses and, and millions of, of lands and all the things that they have, but that is most of the time, that is all they've got. 
most of the wicked perish and are going to go to hell. And whatever they've got here is the best that they'll ever have. Now, I'm, I'm going to just tell you right now, I'm not too envious of that. Now, there's some things in life that certainly, as every, everyone uh, knows and, every, you know, everyone does, there's some things that you would desire to have in life. And I don't believe as long as it's in the, you know, I don't believe as long as it is in God's will and God's plan, I believe, my friend, that that's all right. But the wicked, what they want is more and more. They want, they want to prosper more. It even seeps into, into religion, into some, uh, you know, some uh, quote-unquote preachers that they desire to have all that the world has got to give them and all they can acquire. And I worry about their soul because they too prosper seemingly with not a message and not a plan of salvation. They can have it. I just tell you, they can have it. I'm glad I've got Jesus. They have more than their heart could wish. Now, re remember up here, verse number 2, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. Almost. Remember that word, almost. My feet were almost gone out. I almost backslid. They were corrupt and speak wicked concerning oppression. They speak lofty. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people <coughs> return hither. And waters of full cup are wrung out of them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He said, I thought about all of this. I considered all of this. And he said, it's more than I could handle. And that's why he said, my feet were almost gone. Almost my feet were gone. But then he gets in verse number 17. Until I went into the sanctuary. Hallelujah to God. He said, I got along with God until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood I therein. He said, when I got along with God and I got some instruction from God and I got some teaching from God and I got some understanding from God, I know now what their end is. And after this part of the chapter, we'll read it on. And after this part, we see that the psalmist is no longer almost ready to fail, almost ready to slip. He says, when I went into the sanctuary, I understood therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terror. As a dream when one awakeneth, so, O Lord... When thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Hallelujah to God. The psalmist is seeing here what his end will be. He knows that the end of those that prosper and those of the wicked are going to, is going to end in disaster. It's going to end in catastrophe. And I'll say again, my friend, the world can have this place. The world can have the world and all that's in it. I think I'll stay with the Lord. Amen. I don't want to slip. I found myself many times, even since I've begun to preach and begun to pastor, I found myself a few times almost ready to give up, almost ready just to throw in the towel. You know what the devil would like? He would like for every Christian to throw in the towel and quit. He would like for every believer, every preacher to throw in the towel and quit. But when I see what God has done, and when I understand what God has done for me, and I look around, surely the, the wicked prosper. I look around and see what they have, and I see what I've got. Amen. I think I'll stay with the Lord. Hallelujah to God. I may never have nothing down here to amount to anything. That's fine and well. But my life is short. It's even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. One of these days, they're going to roll my coffin down an aisle, and there's somebody Somebody's going to say a few words over me and somebody's going to say this and that. But a friend, when that's going on, I'll be in glory with the Lord. Amen. My life has just begun, brother. Amen.
Now, how did all that happen? It happened when I accepted Christ into my heart. When I accepted Jesus into my heart, my life just began. I was born in 1957. Figure it out. I'm 58 years old. But for 50, for 50 years of my life, I've been on my way to glory. Hallelujah. I've been on my way to heaven for 50 years. It started when I called on Jesus and asked him to save me. And I began to live. But there's been, there's been battles. There's been struggles. There's been heartaches. There's been trials. There's been testing. And I've got to the place a time or two when I said, what's, what's the use? Now, see, I'll admit to you the things a lot of preachers and a lot of people don't want to admit, but I've been there and I've done that, and the old devil get me beat down, and he says, you might as well give up. You might as well quit. There ain't nobody cares about you no more. There ain't nobody loves you no more, and that was all a lie from the devil to start with, but if you listen to the devil long enough, you'll begin to, you'll begin to believe him. But then guess what happened to me also? I was as a psalmist David, and I got into the sanctuary of the Lord. Not always was it the house of God. Not always was it your church when I've been in the sanctuary of the Lord. Sometimes it's been me and God alone by ourselves, somewhere in a corner, somewhere in the closet, somewhere out on a hillside. And I say, God, I've took all I can take. I say, Lord, I need some help from you. And God, if you don't help me, I'm going to fall. Lord, if you don't help me, I'm going to fail. And when I get to that point and realize it's God or nothing, and I lean on him, guess what? He lives, reaches down and he picks me up and he sets my feet back on the straight and narrow way and I go on for God by his help. Amen. Boy, I'm glad I'm saved. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm glad I know the Lord. I'm glad I've been birthed into the family of God. And I know Him. So, friend, if you know Him today, your feet may almost slip. You may almost fail. But you get into the sanctuary of God and you look at Him and He looks at you and you talk to Him. You just tell Him all about it, Lord. I've about failed you. God, help me that I not fail you. Boy, things will be different from then on. I'm not saying it won't ever come again in your life because it might, because of the discouragement sometimes of others and sometimes of just circumstances. But listen, the next time you face that battle, you won't get as far because you know you better get along with God surely or your feet will fail, your steps will fail. Almost. You too may have failed the Lord. I failed Him. I fail Him every day. But I try my best not to let it get to the point where I quit and give up on God. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and I afterward receive me to glory. That's the end. That's the end of the story. Stay with God. You're saved. You're born again by the grace of God. And in the end, he's going to receive you to glory. Hallelujah. Amen. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Oh, my, it's not my home. I'm just passing through. And listen, friend, one of these days, by the grace of God, I'm going to end it, and, I end it, and, it, and I'm going to end it well when I, step into the, when I step into the throne room of God in heaven. Amen? <clears throat> Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. What's better than God? What's better than him? Who's better than God? I love my wife. She's good to me. For 38 years. Almost. Pretty soon. Right? <laughs> my wife's been good to me. And she's helped me. She's, she's been my perfect helpmate as a pastor and as a husband. She is, she is, she is, she is who... She is who that has supported me no matter what's going on. My wife's been by my side. She's helped me. And till the end, my wife and I will, will support each other, will help each other. But there's coming a day, my friend, when we, get to, when we get to glory, when we get to Him, we'll understand that He is why we existed here on this earth was to serve him and to do his will. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Friends, you've got loved ones down in this life that you lean on, that you, that you love and that you care for. 
And the best thing that you can think of about those loved ones that you care for is that they be in glory with you when you leave this world. Now, me and my wife are saved, and we'll be in glory together. My children are saved, and we'll be in glory with them. My grandchildren, amen, I'm praying God save every one of them. And we, you know, some of them ain't got old enough yet. And I pray God save them, and we see them all in glory. We've got each other, but if we didn't have each other, we'd still have the Lord, amen? If my wife turned on me today, I'd still have God. I'd still have Jesus. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee. Did you hear what he said? For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Those that are lost without God are going to perish and spend eternity in hell. That's what the Bible said. It ain't, it's not me, it's the Bible that says that. Verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Everybody say amen. amen. It's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in thee, Lord, in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. My trust is in him. It is good for me to draw near to the Lord. My trust is in him, and I have put my trust in the Lord, that I may declare all thy works. Friend, if you're saved by God's grace today, we should declare the goodness of God. We should declare to those that don't know the Lord that are lost, we should tell them how good God is. More, more times than not, a conversation will come up <coughs> about the evil of this world in, in people's lives these days and about the turmoil of this world. But listen, friend, and amongst all of that, my God's a good God. My God's a wonderful God. Almost, as I've said, almost, my feet were almost gone. Number one, we see that this man asked that he was a Levite, and uh, uh, he was, uh, some of these psalms that we've read to you are attributed to him. He's the author of this psalm. And he says to himself, I've almost quit. That's what he's talking about. He said, I've almost quit because of the envy that he had in his heart in verse number 3. Because he was envious of what the world had. He was envious of, of the prosperity of the wicked. And he said, because of their prosperity, he said, I'm envious and, and I, I, want, I, I want what they've got. And he became envious of that and that caused him to almost fail, to almost slip. Have you ever almost slipped? Have you ever almost failed God? Have you ever almost said, I'm going to quit, I'm not going to serve God any longer, I'm going to go the way that's easy. You know, the way, the easy way is the way of the world. That's the easy way. Now, it'll be hard on you if you're saved and you go the way of the world. It'll be easy steps to take, but down there some, somewhere, you'll find yourself down in the hog, hog pen slopping the swine as the prodigal son was, and you'll look up and say, I wish I'd have never come this way. I wish I'd have never come this road. But see, the world is on a wide path to destruction and a wide path to hell. And many are there that find their way on that road. But narrow is the way of the, of the child of God. And not many find that way. But friend, if you're here today and, you, and you've cried out to the Lord and asked Him to save you, are on the narrow way, you're on your way to heaven, and we ought to shout to the highest heaven and thank God that we don't have to go to hell. Amen? you're here today and you're lost without God I want to tell you something my friend today today is the day of salvation you must be born again and friends you too can spend eternity in heaven while all the wicked perish and all the wicked go to hell you can live eternally with the Lord now listen friend not all of those that are going to hell are wicked people not all those that go to hell are, 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 are rich people. Many of them are poor folks. But the difference is those that accept Jesus go to heaven and those that deny him go to hell. No matter what circumstance they have in life. I know some good morally people. But I'm telling you, you find them living better than most Christian people live. And yet they won't trust Jesus. They won't believe in Jesus or they have found a false religion that they have sunk their lives into, and they'll, they will not accept Christ as their Savior. That's a shame, friend, but accept a man be born again, no matter how good they are, they'll go to hell without God. Oh, friend, if you're here today and you've 
and, and, and you're a child of God and you've almost slipped, there's millions of people going to hell and you can have the influence on some of them. Amen? You'll have an influence on some of them if you'll just let your light shine before me. And number two, and I'm almost three, in the book of, in the book of Acts chapter number 26, let me read you a few verses here. Acts ver, uh, cha, verse, uh, chapter 26, verse number 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, and they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. This is Paul speaking here of his life and testimony. Have therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. In other words, Paul's telling King Agrippa while he's in prison, he's telling him, he's saying to him, I'm preaching Jesus, that's all I'm doing, is telling about what Moses and, and the prophets said was going to take place. He said, I'm telling all of that. He says, King Agrippa, that's what I'm in prison for. That's what I'm doing. That Christ, verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. While Paul was in prison suffering for the cause of Christ, he has an opportunity to witness to noble people. To the king himself, he has reason to witness to them. It'd been awful good, easy for Paul to say, man, I've done what I've done for God, and look what I've got. I found myself in prison, locked up for the cause of Christ. Paul might well have said, I'm quitting. Amen. Paul might well have said, I'm giving up. It's not worth it. I'm, all I do is go from town to town and get in prison at town after town and I'm beaten and I'm stoned. But he said, for the cause of Christ, I'm going to keep on for God. Now, we have well made picture in our minds the scenario there that day where Paul stood before King Agrippa. Now, he stood, but it was a, it was a hard way for Paul to stand. As you look, as you picture in your mind, the big arena where Paul was situated in, King Agrippa is about 150 feet down there sitting in his place in the arena. Paul is there on the, in the, around the side, around the side of the, of the arena, and there is a chain going through the floor. Paul is bound in shackles, and his arms are in shackles, and his legs are in shackles, and there's a chain running from Paul's hands down through the floor and it has a heavy weight on it. And Paul is pulled down like this while he is talking to King Agrippa. And when he speaks to King Agrippa, he rises up, lifting that weight, and still declares that God's good. Amen. Oh, my friend today. And when he'd get through saying that, the weight would get hard. And he'd lean back over and let it down. And King Agrippa would say something. And Paul would rise up again and say, Oh, King Agrippa. And he said, Oh, noble Festus. He was talking to him also. I'm telling you what, friend. God is worth standing for. Amen. Jesus is worth standing for. So Paul was telling King Agrippa all of this. King Agrippa knew what kind of life Paul had lived. He knew what suffering he'd gone through. And he says this. Verse 25 again, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Paul said, I know King Agrippa knows what I'm saying is true. I know he knows that I've preached the word of truth. I know that he knows that I've stood against evil and I've stood for the things of God. And he is making a very pointed message to King Agrippa himself. And the Holy Spirit of God has arrested King Agrippa's heart. Now listen, the Spirit of God has got his attention. The Word of God has got his attention. Paul has got his attention. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophet? I know that thou believest. Paul looks King Agrippa dead in the eye. And he says, O King Agrippa, do you believe? I know thou knows the prophet. I know thou believest, O King Agrippa.
King Agrippa. And, and listen, King Agrippa, the, the man of the hour, the leader of that, of that day, he stood there and as Paul the prisoner raised up in his chains and he said, Oh, King Agrippa, don't you believe? Oh, King Agrippa, don't you believe? And listen here, what King Agrippa said, one of the greatest verses in the Bible for those that are almost persuaded. He says to Paul, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, such as I am, except these bonds. Paul said, I wish everybody was like I am, except these bonds. Paul said, hey, I wish everybody knew the Lord. I wish everybody had the, had the knowledge of God and salvation and had accepted Christ and His plan. I wish everybody had done it. And he said, oh, King Agrippa, don't you believe? And King Agrippa, the man of the hour, the man that, that, that held the power of Paul's life in his hand and Paul's boldness in speaking to him in such a manner and giving him the truth. And he looked at him and said, almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Almost. You know what happened to, to King Agrippa? To this day, the man is screaming in the pit of hell because he passed up his chance. He passed up his opportunity to get saved by the grace of God. I read no more about King Agrippa and his opportunity. King Agrippa died lost without God and went to hell. And that's been 2,000 years ago. And guess where King Agrippa is today? He's lost and in hell. And he's screaming out in the pit of hell. And you know what's on his mind for all eternity? Almost, I almost got saved. I almost got saved. I almost became a Christian. I hope just about I was right there. And I said no. Oh, my friend today, what a terrible place that's going to be. But it's going to be terrible, more, more terrible for those that almost had the, that almost got in. Brother Max, they almost. <coughs> almost got saved. How many people have said under the sound of my ministry since I've been preaching the gospel and come to that place where almost, almost they got saved. They just about did, but they turned and walked out the door. Many of them never returned. It saddens my heart. It saddens my heart to know that someone would hear the gospel and just about, just about get there, just almost, and they're sitting there and the Spirit of God is speaking to their heart and they're listening to the message of salvation and they know, oh, I need to get saved. I want to get saved. And when the altar calls made, they get up and they stand there and the devil says, you don't want to do that. You'll be embarrassed. You don't know what people will think about you. You've waited too long in life. And they turn and walk out the door maybe to have never have have another opportunity to come to know the Lord. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Friend, today, do you know the Lord? Are you saved by the grace of God? Every head bowed, no one looking around, just for a moment. I preach to you what God has laid upon my heart. And in the stillness of the hour, well, no one's looking around. I want to ask you the most important question that you'll ever answer in your lifetime. I wonder if there's someone here today that'll say to me, Preacher, I have never been saved. If I die right now, I'll go to hell. I wonder if there's one that raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I don't want to go to hell. Why would